Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our readings for today are from Wisdom, chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, Sirach, chapter 31, verses 8 through 11, and the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. And these are the readings for a confessor. And the particular confessor that we're talking about today is St. John Eudes. I hope I pronounced that right. And he died in 1680. What we mean by confessor is, is sometimes maybe people misunderstand and think that we're talking about a priest that's hearing confession there, which that is a confessor because we're confessing our sins to them. But what we mean in the general sense by a category of confessor is someone who lived and, and gave the testimony of Jesus Christ to a heroic um, degree. And so we, we talk in scripture about uh, Jesus says, you will be my witness or you will give testimony to me. Um, so to give witness or testimony or to be a, a, an ambassador for Christ, this is what a confessor, someone that's given the title confessor, that's what they did heroically. So we look at St. John Eudes and the other confessors as people that perfectly gave witness and perfectly uh, gave testimony to Jesus Christ. One of the ways that we can do this, um, and really the focus of this lesson today, is that we simply become a student of Jesus Christ, that we enter into, enroll in the school of Jesus Christ. And so to be a, the word uh, disciple really just means uh, to be under instruction, uh, because that, that the root word there is, is discipline. So discipline and disciple. A disciple is a person that's willing to be disciplined, and a discipline is really instruction. Um, so we, we sometimes, uh, instead of calling things subjects, we call them disciplines. Um, the discipline of mathematics, the discipline of science, the discipline of economics, whatever it might be. What discipline are you in? And to be um, in a certain discipline is to be instructed in that area. And so as disciples, we are in the discipline, the school of Jesus Christ. One of the things that we learn um, it's, it's a very important lesson, and, and all disciples have to follow this. And we learn this from Jesus' words himself, um, our great teacher, and Luke's gospel. This is uh, the chapter 12. He would surely watch and would not suffer his house to be broken open. So again, he would surely watch and would not suffer his house to be broken open. So what do we mean by this? What is the house here? For each of the Christian who has been baptized, once, once our baptism takes place, then the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make their dwelling within this house. So our body and soul are, of course, uh, united together, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make their dwelling within our soul. And so you can think of our, our body and our soul together, our person, as a house. And we have to protect that house now. One of the most important things of someone that is, a, that is in the discipline, the school of Jesus Christ, being instructed in the school of Christ, is that we must protect the divine life. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the great inheritance that we've been given at our baptism, we must protect with our whole life. Um, so think of it as protecting a house. We cannot take the chance of, of allowing this health house to be vulnerable um, and to be broken open. Now it's the thief. Uh, Jesus talks about us in, in John chapter 10 that um, he says, I have come that you may have life and have it. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. But the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So the thief mentioned here in, in Luke 12 is Satan, the evil one, who wants to break into our house um, and instill that divine life. He can't force himself in, though. That's the thing. He. You know, he would uh, basically, if we leave the house open, if we leave the house vulnerable, then he will come in and, and he will try to take that divine life. But it always has to be some of our doing. So this is why when we look at sin, we talk about venial sin, which would weaken the defenses against our house. Um, and then mortal sin, which basically leaves our house wide open so that the thief can come in. And, and we do fall into mortal sin, meaning that we lose the, the state of grace. We lose the divine life and must then have it restored through um, a penance and, and true contrition and then go into reconciliation. Uh, so with this, uh, let's look at some ways that we can leave our house vulnerable, particularly weakened, um, or actually leave our house completely open um, and, and th thus susceptible to Satan. 
And we'll look here really at the seven deadly sins because it's a formula in which the church gives us to be able to examine how vulnerable is our house. Um, so with this, uh, Jesus says to us, or actually St. Paul, who was one of the greatest disciples ever, um, and who, who was willing to be instructed by Jesus Christ and the apostles, he says in Ephesians 4, he says, If you are angry, let it be without sin. Again, if you are angry, let it be without sin. We pray this during night prayer as well, I believe on Wednesday night. This is a, this is a great little phrase because we can put any of the seven deadly sins in here and also the urges that go with them. So here we have an example of if you are angry, anger is an urge, it's a desire. It's a, it's an, a, a human instinct, a human appetite, right? An emotion. So if you are angry, there's nothing wrong with being angry, but we can't let it go into wrath, okay? If you're angry, don't let it be in wrath, which would be a sin. Now, we can go through every single one of the seven deadly sins and match up the desire, the healthy, good desire that goes with them, and say the same thing, that it's okay to have a desire, but we can't let it go into a sin. So let's take, for instance, one of the ones we're very familiar with, the desire for food or the urge for food and drink. This is a good thing because we need to continue to live. But if you have the urge for food, which we do, don't let it go into gluttony. So we have to eat to make this house good. But when we misuse that urge for food, it's going to go into gluttony and that's gonna make our house either vulnerable um, or open altogether. Now let's go into the urge for sex. Uh, this can be a very powerful, strong urge, and we do need it so that we can be willing to reproduce. Uh, and, and so if you have the urge for sex, don't let it go into lust. And then here, with the, with the help of Christ and his church, we have um, some specifics even, not just a general category of lust, but we have particular teachings by Christ and his church. If you have the sexual urge, don't let it go into fornication, which would be sex before uh, marriage. If you have the sexual urge, don't view pornography. If you have the sexual urge, don't uh, commit what we would call self-abuse or masturbation. If you have the sexual urge, don't commit adultery. And so with, with this particular urge, uh, because it's um, such a strong passion and because it's so misused, we actually have a long list of things under the virtue of chastity, which would be offenses against chastity. And we have to obey these things. So sexual urge, good, but if it goes into those other things, it's not good. Um, there is a proper way to eat, and of course there is a proper way to follow the sexual urge. Um, the church teaches that it, if you have the sexual urge, what should you do with that? That urge should always be acted on within marriage, between a man and a woman, and also according to the rules within marriage, which would be an openness to life um, and, and still respectful of the spouses. Uh, let's keep moving on to some of the other seven deadly sins. We should have a love for self. That's a good thing, but we can't let that move into pride. Uh, we should also have a good relationship, a love for others, but we can't have that move into envy. We should have an urge and a desire for wealth and security, but we can't have that move into greed. Um, so it has to be without greed. And then I think there's an important one that is also um, overlooked in our society, and that is the urge for entertainment, the urge for I deserve it, entitlement, um, I deserve a break. So the urge for pampering oneself, entertainment, sleeping, uh, kind of self-medicating ourselves in a sense to numb ourselves. If we have the urge for entertainment or if we have the urge for rest, the urge for sleep, it has to be without sloth. Um, we can't just kind of fall into this numbness in which we ignore the world, we ignore prayer, we ignore our duties, we ignore the people around us. And so I think this is a big one as well. So any of these, we can just say there is a natural urge that's part of this house, it's part of humanity, but we can't fall into sin, which weakens this house or leaves it altogether open and susceptible to um, primarily the devil who will gladly um, steal the divine life from us. So we pray for protection. Uh, we pray, especially looking at the words of wisdom, that he that rejects wisdom and discipline is unhappy.
Why are there so many people that are unhappy? It's because we have rejected the idea of entering into the school of Jesus Christ, that we have not been willing to be uh, disciplined and, and be a disciple, to enter into the instruction and do everything necessary um, that our teacher would ask us to do. Entering into a discipline and being instructed means that we have to listen and we have to obey, it means we have to do our homework, it means we have to turn in our assignments. It's hard work. And so we want to um, pray for the graces necessary to be a good disciple, to stay enrolled in the school of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. Uh, please take the time to visit Link to Liturgy where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.